Hello folks, my name's Henry. I'm in a solution engineer in the pre-sales team here at Raza. So I'm generally talking to our enterprise customers about the challenges that they have with their chatbots and how Raza can potentially help and uh, going over everything from open source to Raza Enterprise and how we can really expand that and add value where we can. So I think larger architecture questions uh, you'd be particularly helpful with or sort of scoping and project scoping as well as, as specific implementation. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, and YouTube has just caught up with us, so that is how much of a delay there will be between uh, questions uh, that people ask and us answering them. And while we're waiting cool. for the first questions to come in, so please feel free to type them in the chat and we will, we will get to them in the order they come in, unless I skip something, in which case, please uh, let me know that I've missed something. Uh, we've had, I would say, a very busy engineering quarter uh, for Raza, and we're uh, we're working very hard on you know new features. But what do you think is the most underused feature we already have in Raza? So what do you think that people you know should know about and use maybe a little bit more than they do? Mm, I really like Raza Interactive and I don't think that gets enough press because as soon as you're starting to even just begin with a bot, it's really nice to kind of go through the flows using that and kind of dig into them, see the logic behind it and then make adjustments that way rather than what I did when I first started, which was brute force my testing and just have the same conversation again and again and again and type it precisely right until the point that it failed and then try and figure it out. Yeah. Uh... That sounds like uh, a little bit of a slower process than, yeah. or maybe less enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Pomegranate says, hi, looking forward to it. Uh, well, I hope you have a great time. Uh, and do let us know if you have any questions. Um, so Raza Interactive, your, uh, your vote for sort of most underused feature. Um, and then I have sort of a corollary to that, which is, um, what do you think is the most misused feature uh, in Raza or the thing where maybe there's the biggest learning curve in understanding where it's useful, um, knowing that you work a little bit more with people who have, you know, large, complex use cases? Is there anything that you're like? Oh, there's a, there's a couple. I mean, the kind of one that springs to mind is stories versus rules as and when. I feel that can be quite nuanced and, and getting that right is tricky. Um, I won't provide an in-depth answer as to how to do that, but there's better resources on my blog to kind of go over that than there is uh, for me to give a couple of sentences. The other thing that I find really interesting, which it tends to be um, multi-bot deployments, um, which tends to come from people who have migrated from platforms that maybe have limitations that mean that you can't just chuck everything into one bot. Mm -hmm. And then it's just not as uh, streamlined as an approach and due to Raza being able to handle ridiculous amounts of intents, it's quite a nice way of keeping everything central, having everything you need in one place and kind of taking it from there rather than having to segment things, test things in five different places, then bring it all together and test it again, like stick it in one bot, make your life easier. Um, you can still do a kind of a compose and build approach, which means if you do want to have that team segregation, you've got the option, but you, you don't have to. Yeah, I think uh, Aquila has a talk on multi-tenancy that's uh, it, It's It's relevant. awesome. It, definitely worth watching. Um, it's, it's on our YouTube and um, really good. Uh, it's, uh, when I first started digging into this topic, that was my starting place for kind of getting over it. So yeah, thoroughly recommended video. Um, we're still waiting for questions, so feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, just to pick up on something that you brought up, which is that um, sort of the difference between Raza and other platforms. And I would say every chatbot platform has its core use case that it's really good for. Like, I think they all exist for a reason. Um, but one of the things that is, um, I don't necessarily want to say unique to Raza, but it's definitely a strength to Raza is that ability to handle very complex assistants that do a lot of things in a, a more centralized way and a more flexible way. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if you had any good examples that you can share, of course, you want to uh, respect uh, confidentiality of our, of our um, customers, um, but any particularly good use cases where you're like, yeah, this is a Raza chatbot. Raza is the system that I would use to build this particular application. So it's difficult to give examples within the realm of NDAs and mm -hmm. other fun things and kind of open uh, conversations that we're having. So, but broadly, you can also make one up. 
Uh, no, no, I know, but we we don't have to. We can be vague but honest. Um, the the kind of main place where we see it is people who build out the starter bot. You know, and you can do that in any which platform you want. That's something really small, potentially like one tiny little use case, fairly brittle. You know what I'm saying about you can do it with brute forcing intent. So I built out a little Raza bot that answered a few HR questions, had maybe three different actions and did that without really looking at the dev process in much depth and just made it work. Then, so you can use that for anything. The next stage above that is where I tend to find companies start to struggle is when they build out something that's a little bit more complex and then they realize that they want to have a broader scope. So you start small, you make a proof of concept. That's awesome. Yeah, automation is the way forward. We're going to throw everything into a chatbot. Fantastic. Then they'll give it like five or six main actions that they want to take care of. They'll get to about three and then they'll start having headaches with the limitations of other platforms. So when you want to have a bot that is multi-channel, a bot that is complex, dealing with a lot of different topics, that's when we start to have those conversations. Mm. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. I find that my conversations go a lot better with people who have more experience developing AI chatbots, who've had that frustration. Mm. And then we can come along and say, okay, cool. So if you're going to have open source or rather X or enterprise as a combo, you get the nice, easy start. You get the tools you needed as an organization to actually do more complex use cases. So it's mm. the more challenging, the better. Um, and then, you know, anything where you want to have, because the other lovely thing is obviously, as everyone here will know, open source mm. means that you don't have limitations. So if you need to have customization, you need to have it work with your own framework, you're going to use your answer. Yeah. And I think it's worth just keeping in mind that not all bots are going to be multi-channel, um, you know, very complex. There's many simple mm. chatbots to be built. Um, but if you are getting to the point where things are, uh, challenging <laughs> we might be a good fit for you uh and we do have uh we got two good questions so the first is from pomegranate the forms are great linking forms is really useful uh but the ml entity extractors rather than keyword matching is also really useful do you use forms a lot um so i'll kick that off to you henry do you use forms a lot uh i do to a reasonable degree um i think the thing to remember with my role is that I'm more talking about the platform than building out a lot of bots. Um, but when I do get into a proof of concept with the customer, I do build them out. So um, it really depends on what they're trying to achieve. Now, in, for example, like a telephony use case or working with a, a big company in that kind of space, then absolutely, because the first kind of thing we're going to be wanting to collect in that sort of conversation is authentication information and you're going to want to grab it in a form. So uh, there are definitely places where they are useful and similarly insurance, again, anything with authentication, collecting address data. These are the kind of bits that I've been creating recently. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I definitely use forms a lot. And I would say my sort of rule of thumb is do I need specific pieces of information from my user? Um, so something like an FAQ bot where my user is asking me questions and I don't, you know, uh, I'm not going to change my answer based on, let's say, whether they're using a web app or a mobile app, and I'm not going to ask them for that information. Um, that's a case where I wouldn't use a form, but I would say in most chatbots that I've built, I have ended up using forms. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and a question from, uh, I think this looks like Vietnamese to me, maybe. I'm so sorry. I know I'm not getting the tones. Um, great question. I don't know how to deal with multiple intents with a user chat. So a user said something, um, maybe they say something like, I want to check my bank balance and book a vacation in this banking travel agency situation, I guess. It's a place where you could do both. Um, what do you do with a situation like that? That's a great one. I'm not, I, I've, I've seen that in principle. Uh, I've not come across that in practice yet. I don't know if you've got more expertise on that, Rachel. Yeah, I, I want to say that we had um, did you do? Let me pull up the docs real quick. Uh, I want to say that we had an experimental uh, multi-intent thing. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, that's cool. Whilst you're digging into that, um, 
One thing that I've seen that addresses that from a practical perspective is um, when our bots have a fallback when they think there's an intent and uh, they don't know. Um, so a good example in that scenario is if you wanted to do a bank transfer and book a holiday, mm -hmm. uh, if it detects that you're in a bank transfer path, then it will ask you if you want to stay in that path, which at least would give some focus. And it is, it doesn't address both intents, but it does keep you in at least one positive outcome for that. However, multi-intent classification seems super cool. So that's good to do some learning for me as well. Yeah. So we do have um, a uh, way to do it. Um, and uh, here is uh, this example that has uh, two intents here. How much money do I have? So checking balances and transfer money, which is a much, <laughs> this is a better example than mine, which are two very different things. Um, and then here's an example of somebody trying to do both. How much money do I have? I want to transfer some to savings. Um, and for this, you would want to create a intent that is a combination intent. Um, so I believe the this plus here is semantic. Um, and you need to provide examples of those things. Something to keep in mind. So or two things to keep in mind. So A, is this something your users are actually doing or are you trying to get ahead of users doing it? Because um, mm -hmm. if it's something that your users are actually doing, yes, you absolutely want a way to handle that. Um, and I would, I would recommend you figure it out. If it's something you're trying to get ahead of doing, I would say that that is the number one cause of over-engineering or cause of prototypes. Um, well, people will surprise you. Also, most you know, conversation agents, chatbots will have a sort of Zipfian distribution. This might be getting a little bit in the weeds, but we're going in there. Get your Mercedes. Um, we'll have sort of a Zipfian distribution of intents. So most intents, um, you know, there's sort of like a, a decay. It's Z-I-P-F, uh, Zipfian. Um, we'll have a sort of decay. So you're going to have some more common things that people want to do. Uh, and then as you go down the long tail, they become less and less common. So this is just sort of a distribution that occurs a lot in language um, situations. So it happens with like words, for example. So you have some words that are extremely common uh, and then many words that are rarer. Um, and if it's something that's very rare, <laughs> then I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to spend time working on it. Uh, and I would recommend you focus on those sort of core things that people are actually saying. So like you were mentioning, Henry, like uh, maybe the first three things out of six might be super important uh, to get right before you start to add additional things um, and update your model in that way. So just to add thing. to that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, if, you, if you've got more, sorry. Um, but just to add to that quickly, that's one of the advantages of conversation driven development as a philosophy. Absolutely. So Absolutely. The really lovely thing that when I am, as I say, pre-sale, so I don't engage with our customers who have built out the shiny production bots as much as I'd like. But when I do, it's really cool to see fully, fully functional, massive stores of conversations that they can then use to train their intents. And then, as you say, if you are looking at that as if you're in distribution and your multi-intent stuff isn't that common, you don't need to be too stressed about it, which is lovely. I'm just going to pull it up really quick so I can uh, show you all what it looks like. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, doo -doo -doo. None of these have not been normed. So I think this is something that it's helpful to see without a um, um, without a logarithmic transform. Yeah, the Wikipedia page is confusing to someone who's not looked at it before. Yeah, okay, here we go. There's one from uh, Georgetown University. So it's this sort of distribution um, where this bottom access axis is rating, ranking by uh, frequency, and this uh, side axis is uh, cumulative count, right? So the most frequent item will be much more frequent than the next frequent item, and so on and so forth. And then you get into this long tail here where you have many rare items. Um, and this is sort of the, a general rule about language data in most situations. Um, so that's the first thing. Do you need it? The second thing to think about is if you have true multiple intents, right? So you have this example where somebody wants to do two things. You are not going to do two things with them at once, right? You are going to pick one of those things to do. Um, 
we don't really have conversations in the same platform in the same way where you have two conversation flows that are happening at the same time and they're just interleaved, right? Um, that's not really how human conversations work. Um, so even if you do have a multi-intent, you're still gonna need to pick what you do next. Um, and I believe that we talk about this in the, uh, yeah, in the, the dialogue management, because uh, the problem is, okay, you've got multi-intent, what do you do next? It's gonna be one of the things that your user wants to do. Um, you might ask them which they want to do first. Um, in this particular case, so checking account balance and then transferring money, you can probably make a strong guess that people want to know their account balance before they make a transfer. Um, and they may also then, after they do the uh, transfer, ask about their account balance again, just to make sure everything went through and the numbers are what they expect. Um, but you're going to need to make a decision in the conversation based on the specific multi-intent that you get. Um, and one of the things you might choose to do is if there is something that could be um, identified as multiple intents, so something like, um, hmm, I'm trying to come up with a good example here. Uh, so someone says they placed an order, you're like, order went through successfully, and they're like, thank you, can I have the tracking number? Um, so that might be the intent think, and that might also be a secondary intent, get tracking information. And in that case, you can probably ignore the thank you intent. Um, and I would actually just put that whole thing as an example in the tracking information intent, um, because it doesn't matter, right? Them saying thank you is not going to change our next action, only them asking for the tracking information is going to. Um, and this is like, I don't know, it's a sort of like high level design questions, but I think that that it's worth thinking about a, is this something you're seeing that you genuinely need to account for? And B, what are you going to do when you see it? Because um, there's, you know, there's the labeling of the turns and then there's the deciding what to do next. And those are two different things. So, uh, yeah, that was a really good question, huh? I hope that was helpful to you. I know we went into a lot of depth, but um, I don't know. I think multi-intents can be really confusing, especially because a lot of our, you know, architecture is designed around one intent at a time. All right. Uh, also, I just want to double check that the <laughs> the tweet for the live stream went live. Uh, so I'm just going to do that really quick. Uh, and while I do that, let me change views real quick. Uh, hit me. I ask this a lot, and I am always really interested to hear the answer. What is your favorite chatbot? Maybe it's one that you've worked on, maybe it's one that you've used, one that you can talk about, obviously. Uh, but is there one that you're really like, this one, this is a good chatbot? Oh, it's difficult. I think probably my favorite one is the one that connects to Haystack. Uh, so it's an FAQ bot and it's awesome with how flexibly you can, and quickly you can build out uh, an FAQ. So effectively, Haystack is uh, an, another AI stack that is used to pass over uh, existing FAQs and documents and wikis mm -hmm. in order to enable you to pass a question through to it and it provide you with relevant information. Mm -hmm. um, and the one that I've seen, and I need to double check if it's available on our public repo or not, but it, it's super cool and what it does is, in this case, it allows you to ask questions about osteopathy. Um, mm. But the amount of effort to hook it up is minimal and it, it's just like you can ask it really in-depth questions and it just gives you really good answers so i thought that was super cool what what is osteopath this is a british thing right um it, it kind of related to chiropractic mm -hmm. i'd say so it, it's osteo as in bones um uh, and that is the sort of question you could ask this this bot if it was here uh, and it would give you a much better answer than me because mm -hmm. I, I only asked it a few questions it's not my kind of subject area of choice um, but yeah, I, I think that one's super cool. Um, yeah, I, I keep meaning to make some sort of initiative tracker with forms as I'm a big tabletop RPG nerd. And I think mm -hmm. I, I will at one point have that be my answer is that I've made something that replaces like Don John. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't got around to building that yet because I've been doing actual work. That's probably more of an evening's project than something I can get away with doing on company time at the moment. Sadly. I mean, it's dog fooding, right? Um, oh yeah, 100%. Yeah. And that's um, that would just just be like tracking whose turn it is in this this game where a bunch of people are sitting around a table. Exactly. Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> yeah, and and also uh, dog fooding is uh, not a term I've ever heard outside of um, like American startups. I would always say drinking your own champagne. Interesting. Um, which is a much nicer here. metaphor for it, <laughs> yeah, right? <yeah>. Like. <laughs> 
it was really confusing the first time I heard that. I was like, that sounds awful. What are they talking about? Um, the the full term is to eat your own dog food, and it means using the products that you you were helping build. Um, mm. Yeah, I I don't remember the first time I've heard it. I think it's pretty like American tech culture in general. It's pretty commonly used. Um, we have a question from Shiva. Uh, does Raza support reinforcement learning? Hmm. Um, I mean, I, I have an answer to this, but I just have a quick question for you, Henry. Um, is that something that a lot of, uh, to the degree that you can discuss this, obviously, respecting NDAs, uh, is that something that our uh, potential customers ask a lot about? It's not come up at all. Mm -hmm. um, to the degree that I haven't even needed to decry my kind of uh, lack of knowledge on the topic. Um, also, to quick note, my internet's just informed me it's unstable, so apologies if I dip in and out, folks. Um, but yeah, no, no, um, I, I, you know, the kind of complexity that we've been going into, that's that's literally never come up for me. Okay. Um, I mean, that's it's just a, a point of curiosity for me. So... I mean, there's two answers here. So one is that we are open source. If you would like to extend Raza to do reinforcement learning, um, that is, of course, an option. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, reinforcement learning is a machine learning paradigm um, where you have a specific objective that you have um, specified. So a really famous example of reinforcement is AlphaGo, um, where the objective is to win Go. I don't know enough about the rules of Go to like break down how exactly uh, the next move was determined. Um, and the, um, you know, uh, at every turn, the agent, so this is an agent-based protocol where your, um, you know, machine learning agent is making decisions about what to do. Uh, if that decision moves it closer to whatever the objective is, it gets rewarded and it continues to move in that direction. Um, and usually there's some sort of um, paradigm where you try a bunch of things and like see what does the best and then keep working on that. And then like if it ends up not working, you backtrack. There's, it's, a, it's a field of machine learning basically. Um, so if you wanted to do it, you absolutely could. The second part of that question is, in general, I do not recommend reinforcement learning as a paradigm for chatbots. Um, so this was actually a really hot research topic around 2016, 2017, right about the time transformers uh, were originally proposed. Um, and the sort of um, outcome of a lot of that work, I think Facebook AI had a, um, there was a, a lot of very, uh, I would say sensationalist news stories. Uh, in 2017 about how Facebook AI's like chatbots learn their own language and they were too intelligent and too smart. Um, and this particular research project was on uh, two assistants that they were training to negotiate. Um, so they, they were talking back and forth, trying to like win this negotiation game, each of them. Um, and uh, from the negotiation standpoint, they did pretty well. They fulfilled their objective. Um, so it was success in that way. Um, on the producing human-like language, it was an absolute failure. <laughs> um, so the the language that ended up being used would be something like and, 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 I, 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 six, five, two. Um, it was very non-human-like. And I'm trying to find uh, an example really quickly, but I couldn't find it on my, my very quick, um, my very quick uh, Google search. So the real challenge with doing chatbots and reinforcement learning is that you usually have some sort of task you're trying to complete because we are we do task oriented dialogue systems right um and that's the objective that people generally train on but there's a second objective that you always have with chatbots which is you have a conversation that works for a human interlocutor and that is much harder to guarantee with reinforcement learning and a big part of that is we don't have like as humans a good stable measure of how well a conversation is going um so you can get people to do like Likert scales and you know rate <laughs> conversation success in the middle of the conversation. There's some like sort of proxies that you can do, uh, but generally they're not very successful. Um, and you might end up with a chatbot that can do the task it's been optimized on under the condi conditions in which it was optimized, but will not be useful as a conversational interface. All of which to say is, yes, you can do it. I would not recommend it. Um, but if it's something you wanted to play around with, definitely um, you can. <laughs> I know that was a very long-winded answer, um, but yeah. It was a very interesting answer, so I think that's cool. Huh. Um, I found a reasonable article, but it doesn't have any examples of that uh, crazy dialogue. The conversation is just them negotiating about balls and hats, which seems pretty cool. That's the one. 
Uh, let mm -hmm. me see if I can find one sec. I know I have this in a slide deck somewhere, and I think it's helpful to see the language output. Um, I'm pretty sure I talked about it in this talk because this is um, a very common uh, question for me to get is around um, is around reinforcement learning, uh, specifically from people who are more in the uh, the machine learning space. It's not that talk. One of my talks has a slide that's relevant. I promise. Let me see if I can figure it out. Mm. This one, maybe? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, of course, Eva. I hope that was helpful. Um, I don't want to say that it will never be a viable approach for chatbots, uh, but currently, I don't think it is one I would recommend. Put it that way. Uh, Fine, son. Good to see you. It has been a while. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Uh, I know things are not great in the Horn of Africa right now, to put it mildly. Uh, is it this one? Sorry, I'm just going through my slides <laughs> for my many and sundry talks. Uh, this is the problem with creating so much good content, Rachel. You've, you've got too much stuff to scroll through. Needs more tagging. I do have a lot of things, unfortunately. Um, let me see if I can find a specific example, because I know they had one on the Facebook blog. Uh, blog reinforcement learning negotiation. Uh, I've got the deal or deal Facebook engineering link I can pop over. Oh, that might be it. Engineering.fb.com seems promising. It does seem promising. And I know it was one of their research blogs where they, they shared the... Uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't have the proper... Oh. Uh, uh, well, this is frustrating. Uh, I guess we will just um, pass on that. And then if other folks have questions <laughs> about it, I can try and go back and find it. Um, yeah, I don't have it to hand. Oh, also, I didn't warn you. Um, my internet has been a little bit flaky recently. So if I disappear and the stream suddenly ends, it's because I've lost internet connection. Uh, Western Washington is um, having a really big storm right now, just sort of like all over the state. And it's caused a lot of issues. Yeah, my so, yeah, um, I'm waiting for more questions. Feel free to pop them in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, question for you, Henry. Um, I know there have been um, a lot of questions that I've gotten recently, uh, particularly around sort of installing Rasa X and getting that set up and sort of like recommendations for deployment. And I know you tend to work a little bit earlier in the process than like deploying the finished system. Uh, but if you had like one tip for people who are in that stage of their project, what would you recommend? Hmm. Well, I mean, where are we on now in term are we good to talk broadly about open releases or upcoming releases because a lot's going to change that's my only thought yes <laughs> that is true uh that might be your tip you know uh check check for things that yeah. are going to change I, I will i will i will keep it slightly vague then but it is uh so at the moment uh, depending if you're looking for a quick install then currently the answer is local mode which is dead straightforward to set up um, if you are looking for something that you want to productionize or have that kind of like always on server approach, um, uh, nothing particularly to it aside from making sure you've got a properly configured um, Kubernetes environment and follow the prompts really. It's kind of step by step. Um, the thing that I will uh, just alluded to there is do keep checking back uh, week and week at the moment because stuff is a change in the times they are changing as they say and um, the, all of that might be very different very shortly in a very good way. Uh, everything I've seen of preview stuff is significantly streamlining so it's exciting. I think if you are interested in uh, helping us with future releases, um, in the Rosa newsletter, there's been a form to sign up to volunteer. So if anyone's interested, uh, let us know. Um, yes, check the space. Uh, and we have a question from Saval. Saval, sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Uh, I want to take a chatbot live in Microsoft Teams. Uh, my company wouldn't let me use NGROC, so I set up a virtual machine and also requested a web server for Nginx, uh, but I don't know how to configure it. Um, so this is a VM with Nginx. So the first thing to do with that would be the um, connector for uh, Microsoft Open Bot Framework would be how we'd get chatting to Teams. Um, 
that will be what you need to configure to get that talking via Teams and you don't need to mess around with NGROC for that. How you would then, the bits you'd need to use NGINX for with that, I am less clear. Um, we tend to use NGINX from a load balancing perspective and if you're talking to that directly, I don't think that'd be a problem. Um, but that is the page of the docs that should get you yeah, kind of started with that process. Yeah. So if you're um, you're running your virtual machine locally, then I would point the the endpoint to you know the appropriate numbers here for your situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Local host port blah. Okay. Yeah. Get yourself set up. Uh, and just to reiterate a point that Jamie made last week, uh, do make sure that you are not exposing uh, the endpoints unsecured to the internet at large. Mm. Absolutely particularly um, if it's going to be an HTTP one, so that you're having uh, plain text conversations that anyone could sniff. Yeah. Yep. Keep that nice and secure, folks. Yeah. Uh, Spall has a uh, follow-up. Uh, how do I run Raza on Nginx hosted URL instead of running it on my server? Should I make changes on the back end? What should I make? Uh, what should the change look like? I don't want to use Docker. So it sounds like there might be some uh, security considerations from the, uh, the company that Spall is working for. Yeah, no, that's that's quite common. Um, particularly when yeah, you you know you can have like limited access with things like Docker. We we see a lot of resistance to Kubernetes. Um, in terms of that specific deployment, I think that's a bit of a tricky one to troubleshoot in this sort of environment. That's probably a question that would uh, you'd be have better help with on the forum. Um, because I think there's a bit of additional information that we. Uh, need to kind of dig into there. So really good starting point, like lovely that you've highlighted you don't want to use Docker, so we understand the scenario that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, other useful troubleshooting things with that would, I mean, be basic version information across with everything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think what else we'd need to get going with that. Are you using Razor X or is it just open source that you're using? Mm -hmm. um, as much info as you can provide into that forum post, and then we can come back to you on that and kind of dig into it in a bit more depth. Yeah, um, especially if you're not using Docker, it sounds like a pretty, uh, a pretty complex installation case. So, yeah, I think mm. I think the forums is going to be the the most helpful uh, place for that. Um, one more time, let me pop up the URL. It's down there. The um, the one thing I'd say with that is, it's. And this is not from a rather specific thing as as much as someone who's been trying to get people to do enterprise software for the last five, six years. It's always worth begging IT. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's, 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 you know, I, you know, I've, 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 I've got access to pseudo with donuts on one occasion. Um, I've got access to group domain passwords and terrifyingly large organizations with similar snacks in other places. But um, yeah, because the the only thing with that is you are making a lot of complexity for yourself. Um, and even if the policy is generally a no, if you can somehow get around that policy, it is definitely worth it. It might save you more hassle in the long run. Yeah. Uh, and that would be to use Docker. Um, I think I'd probably agree with your IT department here that NGROC is probably not the best choice for deployment. Oh, certainly not for deployment, no. Um, that, that's, it's a really useful testing tool, but I wouldn't want that as a prod thing. Yeah. Uh, another question from... Oh, no. Same Shiva. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> another question from Shiva. Uh, can you suggest to me uh, repos or links of some of the best bots developed using Raza so I can learn more of it? That's a great question. So I believe we have some stuff. Well, I... Caveat first. So the uh, things that have been built um, by our customers, uh, they're probably not going to share the code <laughs> just for security reasons. Um, Makes me sad though, because the amount of investment that customers put in stuff, it, they probably are literally our best bots. Um, have you gone past a few there, haven't you? Uh, yeah, so what I want to show off is that we do have a community showcase where you can see some more examples. Um, so this is the developer portal. It's raza.com slash docs. Uh, and in the community showcase, we have uh, a lot of um, bots that are we are telling you about. Like, I don't know that since I, the source code is available, so that is a little bit of a limiting factor. Um, 
Also, if you have an assistant that you want to uh, show on the uh, the showcase, please feel free to get in touch, uh, and we'd love to hear about it. Uh, I'm trying to remember which of these has um, open source code. I'm pretty sure this one does. I feel somewhat, uh, somewhat sure. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So this project yeah. is on GitHub. Um, so I would go through these and see which of them have code available. Um, so this is the Cal Fire Alert chatbot, um, and all the code for this is available. And there's a nice little README. The one other thing I'd add to jump onto this is if it is for your kind of education and getting started, we do have awesome starter packs as well. Um, Absolutely. Which are kind of uh, industry specific. So there's a financial one. Um, and various other bits and they are there so that you can kind of go okay if I'm willing to build out a bot that would do useful things in this organization mm -hmm. here's I don't know 30% of the core of what I want and then you can add to that and make it specific for your specific use case. Definitely so um, this one for example is the financial demo um, which is for, for the finance domain. <laughs> I don't know maybe obviously um, which has as you can see uh, quite a lot of complexity um, and uh, currently is for 2.x and uh, watch the space for the future. Uh, mm. And the other one that I recommend a lot is the help desk, help desk bot uh, because that shows handoff, um, which is a lot of something that we get a lot of questions about. So handoff is when someone's chatting to a bot and you wanna send them somewhere else, maybe to a person, maybe to a different bot. Um, and the example in GitHub is to a different bot because we don't have just like a person live 24 seven for our demo bot. Um, I don't know, <laughs> maybe at some point in the future that might be feasible, but right now it sure ain't. Um, so this has a uh, example of an action to do the handoff um, from one bot to another. So you can use that as a, a starting point for your own work. And watch out for my pull request on the financial demo starter pack that will allow you to book holidays on there as well. Holidays? Holidays. Holidays. Oh, that'd be fabulous. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Quality. Oh, no. Okay. I think we might have lost Henry, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to keep going and nope, that's me. I'm gone. <laughs> Wait, am I back? You're back. Are oh, we still come here? on. Please reconnect. Please reconnect. I, so you're here. Uh, I think we might have um, lost the stream. No. Unfortunately. Oh, no. Oh, wait. We might be live? We may be um, live in a new place. One sec. Hold, please. If you're watching us, um, I'm happy. <laughs> If we we do a bit of crack. Okay, are, are we back in the same YouTube? Uh, is my question. Let's make sure this muted. We are. Oh wow, we fixed that issue. That's fantastic. I'm really glad to hear that. Okay, great. We're back. We're back in the same video. Even. I warned y'all about the internet issues, and they happened. Mm. All right. But we 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 survived, which is better than normal. Success. It is. I, I did have to warn Rachel uh, before joining that I am cursed when it comes to any form of live stream or webinar. Um, like literally my monitor has died on me mid webinar that I've been hosting without, it's never done it before or since in the three years I've owned it. It just turned off. Um, Gremlins. Bizarre things. All right. And thankfully we're back because we have some more questions. Um, so one for Nick. Hi, Nick. Uh, should Raza server and website server be the same IP or should it be different uh, when we're deploying the Raza chatbot? The, given that they're operating on different ports, it shouldn't be problematic. Um, it depends on the scale of your deployment. So if you're going to have uh, a full scale deployment, you have them in different pods and based on Kubernetes and you will allocate them different IPs internally to that anyway. Um, but for a small one, there's certainly nothing wrong with testing on that. Um, and if you are looking to do something big, it's always worth having a chat with us anyway. Yeah. Nice quick one. 
Uh, and Pfizer says, uh, I finished my degree with a final project. Hey, congrats. Uh, doing a Fantastic. Rosabot that can predict the likely disease a person might have by asking the user their symptoms. Okay. Um, Glad to know, Raza. We'll never forget you guys. I'll never forget you either, Faisa. That's fantastic. Congratulations. That's, that's uh, so cool. And also, um, so I come from a healthcare background and will be at some care, at some point building out a, um, st a starter pack for that environment, Faisa. So I'd love to hear more about that at some point. Um, if we go back to the showcasing of bots that uh, Rachel mentioned earlier, like, please put it on community if you can. That would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And that is... Uh... So uh, raza.com slash showcase no spaces. Um, yeah, especially if it's not in English, that would be amazing to have some more um, examples. Mm, I'd love to understand the API if you've got a um, API to one of the kind of symptoms checkers in the background, because I was trying to find one of those that was open and I was struggling when I had a quick look. So that would be super cool. Huh. Um, also, this is not related to anything, but I learned it this week and it's been absolutely just like, every time I think about it, I'm like, huh. Uh, so something like 50% of Facebook's uh, voice messaging traffic comes from Cambodia, I believe, because the primary language spoken there uh, does not have a keyboard. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's super interesting. Isn't it? I don't know, just thinking about that sort of basic level of access that we expect people to have uh, to, to technology that is absolutely not there for everyone uh, and is definitely not equitable. Um, mm. Yeah. God, the data use must be huge comparatively. Yeah, uh, especially given, you know, um, you know, varying infrastructure availability. Um, Precisely, that was what I was thinking, like, you know, yeah. at least messages can try and resend as opposed to live conversations if you are on a sketchy signal. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> uh, also, I don't know if you can hear my dog. You want to come up and say hi? Hop up. Hop up. No? Okay. He doesn't want to. <laughs> he's shy today. Uh, he's just going to bark. Um, yeah, sorry. That was apropos of nothing, but I've been thinking a lot about um, sort of... I mean, I'm always thinking about equity and access, and I think that was a really good example of uh, mm. maybe a, a yeah. counter use case. So. Hugely interesting. Oh. Um, also, even though we're not uh, getting your pup, there are lots of pictures of dogs on the screen because we've got that uh, Sensei GIF scrolling, which is, has a person looking for dogs. So. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's in this little little thing. Um, mm. Yeah, this is a, a good example chatbot. So this was at the Raza Summit, the last one that was in perfect in perfect in person in San Francisco, I think. Um, and this is a sort of a chat based. Uh, I believe it's for a. Adobe Photoshop. I can click through and we can just look at it. I don't have to remember on the top of my head. I'm pretty sure it's for Adobe Photoshop. Yeah, um, that lets you uh, look through pictures with a with a voice chat. So I think it's a cool application. Yeah, it's a super cool one. Um, there's some links on YouTube for that. that are, sorry, not YouTube. Uh, I've seen on LinkedIn that we've got that are super cool. I think there's also a talk on YouTube um, in the Raza Summit 2019 playlist, maybe? Indeed, I'm being silly because what I meant was there is a link on LinkedIn to a YouTube video that's awesome about this. Um, is that is indeed the one I've seen. Uh, it's a really cool demo. If you haven't watched it, I'd recommend it. Mm. Uh, and Shiva says, you people are doing great. Keep going. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shiva. I uh, hope we are, we are helping out. All right. Uh, ah, <laughs> uh, Vin30 has a question. Uh, I have, uh, sorry, that's me saying I have, this is not what Vin30 said. Uh, how do we handle the following scenario for a food ordering bot? I want to order a pizza, not burgers. So negation of an entity. Great question. Hmm. I have to think about that this. Is super cool. Yeah. I think the first thing to touch on is how frequently does that happen in everyday conversation? So we're going back to um, that awesome phrase that Rachel said that I now have learned about um, in terms of languages that I've forgotten in terms of distributions. It's a what sort of distribution? Uh, Zipfian, Z-I-P-F. Zipfian. That is one of the coolest words I've ever heard and <laughs> very low in the Zipfian distribution of words. Um, 
But um, with that in mind, yeah, um, I don't, I've not come across that negation before. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I can give you the NLP researcher answer, which may or may not be a good <laughs> practical application, um, which is usually you'd solve, this is just a, the first um, paper that I came up with on the ACL anthology for negation and shallow semantic parsing. So usually this would be a parsing problem problem uh, because you want to know what not modifies. Here it modifies burgers, but it could order whether or not you want to order, right? I do not want to order burgers or pizza, in which case both pizza and burgers would be negated, if that makes sense. So you need to do some sort of hierarchical modeling of the language, uh, and that sort of general task is called parsing. The benefit of shallow semantic parsing is that um, it is faster, basically. Uh, so you have less uh, less likelihood to do latency. I would not do a full parse tree. Okay, this is big, big X. Do not do a full parse tree for every turn in your assistant. It will add a lot of latency and you will have very narrow use for it. Um, so if you wanted to do the super like linguistic -y, researchy NLP um, approach, I would do shallow parsing. Um, you're probably going to have to build a custom module for that. If you wanted to do uh, the sort of hacky engineering approach, which is what I would probably do in this situation, um, I would uh, probably have an intent for negation. <laughs> Uh, so I would have an intent with like orders with negation um, or that have like mixed scope or something like that. So if someone says like, I don't want something or I'm not looking for something anywhere in the um, uh, in the text, I'd probably have a bunch of examples of that. And then I would have um, a response that's like, hey, I'm not entirely sure what it is. What do you want to order? I have some sort of phrasing or clarification question that's going to have way lower latency um, the and be less engineering work. The potential risk there is that if people are using negation words in other intents where you don't care about the scope of negation, you might run into slight problems. Um, so that that negation intent might be greedy and might end up, you know, capturing a bunch of stuff you don't want it to. So those are the two approaches I would take if, as Henry says, um, this is something that you're actually seeing. Um, there's I keep I'm going to make a video on pragmatics, which I think will be helpful. But generally, people do not ask for things that they don't want, if that makes sense. Right. So if someone's like uh, unless there's specifically like allergies. Right. If someone's like, hey, what do you want for, to have for dinner? People are usually not, not going to be like, I want Chinese food and not Thai food and not Vietnamese food and not pizza. Right. That's generally that would be a sort of a weird conversational turn, at least in, in my culture. Uh, yeah. So that's, those are the implementations I would look at if you genuinely need this. Um, and if you don't, then you don't. Easy peasy. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Question from Rob. Hi, Rob. Uh, one topic I'm struggling with recently is privacy and user messages. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you handle training Raza X uh, and trying to anonymize user data to a certain degree, uh, like names, addresses, and so on? Fantastic question, Rob. Um, privacy is so important and under looked in large organizations. So kudos to you for making an effort and also keeping yourself compliant with GDPR, Poppia, HIPAA, depending on where you are in the world. Really, really, really important. Um, there's a couple of different approaches. Uh, Rachel, I'll leave you to dig into any specific tips for Raza, but depending on what flavor of backend you're storing the messages in, one of the things you can look at doing is having an instance that effectively clones the tracker store and then masks it. So we've you've got entity recognition already so you know where in the messages these fields are that you need to, the data that you need to mask and then there's various masking solutions and I'm going to be completely agnostic with that because I did used to work for a masking organization um, but um, that you can then use to actually sanitize that data and bring it in uh, to a format that will be privacy maintaining now obviously that can then potentially affect the training of the bot so there's considerations around that too um, but there are, that would be my kind of initial take on an approach. Uh, Rachel, I'd love to hear any further thoughts that you had. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think there's sort of two main things to think about here. So one is people seeing it and you storing that data, um, where I think masking is a, a great approach. Um, 
if your main worry is about model training and things being stored in weights, yes. <laughs> uh, I would say the one of the benefits of the ROS approach is we don't recommend neural language generation. Um, and I would say in terms of like data leakage, that would be my main concern um, where people can use specific queries um, or specific prompts to get out uh, underlying training information. And there's been a lot of research recently on how easy that is, particularly with large neural language models. Um, so I would recommend not using them for language generation as part of your bot, especially if it's public facing. Um, but yeah, we, we do entity extraction, so um, you can definitely use that as a starting point. I will also say any sort of automated system for masking, you cannot make a guarantees uh, about total privacy. Like there will probably be something that's missed. There will probably be something that's like erroneously masked. Um, yeah. So the, the free text masking is the hot topic when it comes to any sort of masking company. Um, and as Rachel says, yeah, that is a hugely challenging thing to get right. However, if you're doing it with something that's a fairly robust process and catches 99% of it, you're doing a damn sight better than a lot of organizations. Um, the other thing to highlight there from an organizational perspective is when when you're using uh, Razor Enterprise as opposed to uh, Razor X or Razor Open Source, we do have role-based access control. And that means that you can limit people who can view those messages to a specific group, obviously tie that into LDAP or any form of single sign-on that you want to use. And then that deals with that from a user perspective internally within your org, um, which is a nice straightforward one to kind of start with at least. Yeah. Uh, really good question. Mm. Uh, Khalid wants to know uh, two things. Uh, one, can you tell us Raza versus IBM Watson? I have not used Watson, uh, so I'm afraid I won't be able to give you any any deep insights. I only based on what are uh, people who have an IBM Watson bot and then are looking at Raza and then, then have currently you know are in the process of making that move. And broadly speaking, what I've I've heard from other people is that Watson can be great to get started. And I, I'm kind of touched on this earlier. You get the initial case going, you do your first bit, it's fantastic. You get it up and running. And then as soon as you want to make it more complicated, that's when you start coming up against limitations of SaaS platforms and things that are kind of a little bit more restrictive. And that's when people tend to want to start talking to us about Raza. But I've not used it enough to comment, I'm afraid. And we do have a sampling problem where we are not going to talk to the people who have started with Watson and really like Watson and it's meeting all their needs because they're not going to talk to us about a different platform. So, um, Absolutely yeah. valid, really to mention. Um, another question from Khalid, is there a Slack channel for the Raza community? Uh, the only Slack channel we run is uh, for contributors. So if you make a contribution to Raza, um, I believe there's a community run Slack channel. Um, and I believe there's also some local ones. So I think there's one in China on, I was going to say WhatsApp. I don't think it's on WhatsApp, uh, but there's also some like specific, um, you know, um, there's specific user communities that are user run. The only one that we run is for the contributor program. Ah, uh, and uh, oh, this is in Cyrillic. I'm going to say tapak. I think that might be wrong. My apologies. Uh, can we predict intent using the Raza X API, like an endpoint in the Raza API model slash predict? Are there any ways to predict intent via the Raza X API or custom channels with JSON response? Thanks, Jason or Jason, whichever you you tend to say. I, I'm a firm in the Jason camp, but um, let me pop open the Raza X docs really quick. I think there is a predict endpoint somewhere, but I don't remember what it is. Yeah, I was about to say I, I'd need to dig into the API for that. Mm, I know we have a pretty uh. We see, bah, 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 bah. let's see the API spec. I think that's probably going to be the best place to look. Um, oh, that took a while to load. I hope we're not losing internet. <laughs> Fingers <laughs> crossed. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I think it mm, might be under models. No, that's for changing models. Um, uh, there's an intense list down there if you go far enough. There we go. List intents. 
there's yeah. intense and yeah 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 cool this one create a mm. new nlu insights report doesn't look like it's giving you what you want yeah my gut instincts that there is that there is one. I have not worked with the Raza X API enough to know off the top of my head. So what I would recommend is to head to the forums and ask. Uh, and I would ask in the Raza X uh, chan channel forum area. I don't know what the right uh, right noun is for that. Section. I, section. Yeah. Yeah. Section. Yeah, I have a, a strong intuition that you can because you have a Raza open source. Um, if you have Raza X up and running, it is also true that you have Raza source open up and running. So there must be a way to use the Raza X API to connect to Raza open source, but it might be easier to just query the Raza open source endpoint. Yeah, I, I, I guess the question we come back to, what are you trying to achieve and is it the best way to do it? Mm -hmm. And as Rachel said, like, is it easy to just use the open source one? Awesome. All right. We just have a couple minutes. I don't know that we have time to get through all of these questions. Uh, we're just going to buckle down and do a little bit of rapid fire. And if we don't get to yours, uh, again, please feel free to head over to the forums. The forums. I've got my little animation down there if you're wondering why I'm pointing to the bottom of the screen, Henry. Uh, so number one. Uh, is Raza focusing on question answer generation from documents? No, <laughs> that's not our core use case. Um, oh, we're more than happy to you know, have integrations. Uh, we're open source, pretty well documented. So you can definitely add your own, but it's not something we're focusing on right now. Uh, Faiza says, I wish I could come and work for your company. Uh, Dr. Rachel, I'd love to learn a lot from you. We've got open positions. Let me get this, uh, pull up the jobs. So we do have open positions. I can make no informed noises about um, relocation or anything, but I don't think it hurts to apply. Um, so we have my team has an open position. If you happen to speak Mandarin, uh, designer, and then we have um, quite a few engineering positions that are open as well. Um, especially since you finished your degree, might be might be time to apply. Uh, so yes, we are hiring a lot. Uh, Khalid says, can I pick a mobile number for WhatsApp client? I don't know. Do you know off the top of your head? No, I've, any bots I've built have been not WhatsApp, they're Telegram in terms of the integration because it's a bit quicker. Uh, Vipool says, oh, it's a parse endpoint to get the response via the API. Thank you so much. Uh, and also, can we add convert featureizer in the pipeline? Does it improve results? Um, Yes, you can add convert in the pipeline. Uh, I believe if you are using Raza 2.0 plus, it is included by default. Um, whether or not it improves results will kind of depend. I'd say in most situations, it doesn't hurt. Um, if you have a very small assistant, you might not see dramatic improvement just because you don't have quite enough training data. Um, also, I believe Convert currently is pre-trained with English data. I'd have to double check. Um, so you may mm -hmm. need to, to retrain with your, your target language. Oh, the internet's stuttering. Come on, Bessie. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> we can do it. We've got 30 seconds left. Uh, yeah. uh, and then Vin says, uh, thanks. Uh, so this was the person who asked the question about negation. I've actually not come across this requirement, but I saw the query I'm answered in the forums. Ah, how do we deal with negative entities using diet? I did give a couple of ideas, but wasn't sure how to handle the situation. Um, yeah, so it looks like uh, Vin also did not come across it, um, the, those negative entities. Yeah, I'd be, uh, cool. I'd be surprised, but I think there are ways to deal with it. All right, it's time. My internet hasn't crashed again, and we got through all the questions. Uh, thanks Fantastic. so much for joining today, Henry. Um, this was super helpful. We'll be back on Friday at 1 p.m. specific, so um, three hours after this time now. Uh, and we'll be talking about over-engineering and how to avoid it. So some of the things that I tend to see, uh, especially mistakes that people who are new to the framework tend to make, and uh, why do more work when you can do less work and get results that are just as good or better? So we'll be talking about that. I hope you all can join me then. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you on the forums and uh, in the comments. So thanks, thanks everyone.